Thank you. Uh, maybe one point, if I can add, uh, on this, because in Morocco, when there was the issue of family laws, uh, demonstrations went out pro and against. And the against were mostly women, larger numbers than pro. And here, maybe the question becomes, do we need, my opinion is yes, we should, uh, open dialogues with Muslim women who are against reform. I think this kind of dialogue is very important. So at least we know how they are thinking and what they are thinking. We need, we need to give our message to them. Uh, and I, I think this should be a, a major one of the activities of uh, uh, disseminating knowledge is also disseminating large knowledge to groups like that and not see them as enemies, but rather as people who need to come on board as we go along. Last speaker, I just uh, had the pleasure to meet her before we sat on the table, and um, uh, I was trying to learn her name, so I said, uh, shall I say, are you obey? Obi? She said, no, 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 it's obey, like verb to obey. And then I laughed, I found something in common, because when people don't know how to pronounce my name, I tell them it's obeyed, like the past tense of obey. So <laughs> we found something in like common. Um, thank you very much. I feel like I'm um, about three kinds of fraud here today, actually. Um, firstly, because I, I am supposed to talk about um, founding a woman, uh, an NGO, and I have not founded an NGO. It, the one that I lead is not a woman's NGO. And um, I'm also here to talk about Islamic women, and I'm not... Um, I'm not them either, so um, you... But I, I have to say that in, in, in regard to all three things, that um, what has happened to me is that I have learned a lot more than I... And, and perhaps the main thing I've learned is that I know less than I thought I started off with. I became president of the Civil Liberties Organization, which is um, Nigeria's oldest indigenous human rights group, um, in 1995. And um, I was the second president. It was quite a crucial time. I think in, in, the, in the life of any NGO which has been founded, Cielo was founded in 1987. And the um, founder president had done eight years. And um, one is either going to continue with the president for life syndrome, or one is going to have to make the break to see is the organization itself dependent on the personality of the founder, or is the organization going to survive? Um, now, the position of president of CLO is actually a volunteer's position, but we have full-time staff led by an executive director. Unfortunately, and, and so really the transition ought to have been quite simple, but unfortunately at the time when I became president, my executive director was in detention without trial, we were under military dictatorship at the time. And some other of my key staff were under um, detention. We had um, had our offices raided, and the, the staff were, were rather um, scattered and, and not really sure about whether or not we should continue. So it wasn't necessarily the best time to become president. And also, shortly after I became president, um, Nigeria um, really hit the headlines by the execution of nine environmental rights activists, the Ogoni Nine, so that um, it wasn't the best of times. Even, even without the difficult situation, though, I think that um, the transition from founder to um, continuation in the life of an organization is something that's important. As I said, I didn't necessarily have the key staff there, but I did have staff who um, were working in the CLO. And I think that at every stage, whatever kind of organization, whether it's a women's organization or whether it's a general human rights organization as the CLO is, that um, the, the full-time and the volunteers really have to mix. I mean, CLO is actually a membership organization, but um, I have found that there's a dynamic, which sometimes is um, a negative dynamic and sometimes it's a positive one, between the volunteers, the members, and the full-time staff, who basically are like a librarian who thinks that the library would run, run very well if the people wouldn't keep on coming and looking at the books and that the um, full-time staff feel that these um, members are just popping in and popping out. But um, I think also that one thing that one would um, see about, about 
being involved in, in human rights is that there's a, there, there are certain assumptions. I, I always used to avoid the description of myself as an activist because I would say, well, I'm just a legal practitioner. How did I get involved in becoming president of CLO? Of course, I was a vice president of CLO before I became the president. But I'm always careful to point out to people who want to accuse me of bravery that at the time I became vice president, we were on the verge of transition to civilian rule from military, military dictatorship. And I had assumed that when the issue of becoming president came up, everything in the Nigerian Democratic Garden would be rosy. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out like that. But, um, but one thing I can say for we women is that we rarely turn back once we've put our hands to the plow. And this is even though um, we may have commitments of family which make others say, look, why are you risking these things? And in a way, you end up finding that actually the reason why you are risking these things is because you have young ones coming after you. And you perhaps don't want to, to leave them with the kind of situation in which people are still afraid to talk, still afraid to speak out, still afraid to do anything. Um, I think that um, within an organization, too, one thing that I found in my experience was that however much there's the enemy outside, there are always, within an organization, different types of factions and different political currents. And perhaps one of the things that women bring to these situations is more capacity to manage all and make all feel included and to do less of making some factions who are perhaps not as dynamic as others feel excluded. Um, in the CLO, certainly we had what one might call a small group of politically minded men who perhaps felt they wanted to be in charge of the organization. And then the generality of the staff and members who didn't have any particular axe to grind, but began to feel threatened. Um, one of the things I had to do as the CLO president was to achieve some harmony between these different uh, factions. And I think that um, it is not so much that women are not threatening, it is that women women's groups because there's nobody to snigger when you um, fumble or mumble your words. On the contrary, if you are not speaking in an articulate fashion, there's support and encouragement to continue, rather than <laughs> making a, a mess of it. And so I think that in that context, women's groups have a very important role to play. On the other hand, being in mainstream human rights, I find that all the best women are in the women's groups. And it's quite difficult to, um, you know, to explain why is the, the board of CLO so unrepresentative? Why is the staff of CLO so unre unrepresentative? Why is the um, membership of CLO so, so unrepresentative? Um, it's true that um, if one is Margaret Thatcher, one would want to um, indulge in the Queen Bee syndrome. But in today's world, it is, um, it's difficult because you have to explain yourself. Why don't you have enough women? Why don't you have more women? involved and unfortunately as I said many of them are involved in the women's movement directly. Um, but having said that, I think that women are, um, I, I found all over um, in Nigeria, because, partly because of becoming the president of a, a major human rights organization and being a woman there is a, a certain visibility and one is generally asked to talk to, to varying groups whether it's, and, and, and often they are women's groups. I mean, um, just last week I had a um, four-hour journey to talk to a group of um, women in the university and they formed a campus ladies league. They felt that they didn't, um, that, that although they were learning and they were going to go on to the um, Nigerian job market when they finished graduating, which is, um, has about three million unemployed graduates, they felt that beyond equipping themselves with um, things that would get them their degrees, they wanted to be contributing citizens within the Nigerian context. And um, so I went to talk to them about globalization and what it meant to Nigerian women. And the interesting thing was that when I asked how many of them, I started off by asking, did any of them feel threatened by globalization? And um, it was a mixed audience, but very few expressed any fear about it. And at the end of my, my discussion, it turned out that very few really understood or knew what globalization really meant. 
Um, I, I put it in its economic context, of course, um, liberalization, removal of trade subsidies, um, privatization, um, removal of barriers, and so on. And it um, explained why some of these things ought to be of concern to um, Nigerian women, but also that it presents opportunities for Nigerian women, or for women in general, because of the capacity to interact with others. And then the question arose, yes, well, this is okay for you who have access, I, I don't actually have access to the internet, but I do have email, or, or to a part of the internet. It's okay for you, but what about the woman in the village? And um, I think this is something that has come up throughout this morning's discussions as well, that what is the relevance of, in, of internet? And we use this proverbial, proverbial woman in the village, not because she is um, ignorant, but because she is apparently cut off. But she's not necessarily as cut off as we imagine, because we do go, and, and to me, the importance of the internet is not that everybody is going to stand around tapping into a computer, but that those who do are going to spread the word and spread the message. I find when I come to countries here that everybody sits in front of their own computer and does what they're doing privately. If you, even in my own house, well, I guard my own laptop very severely, but with my desktop, if one person is using the desktop in my house, there are three or four people standing around, poking their noses into what is going on. And um, so it is a, perhaps a much more interactive um, medium than it is in, in a country where everybody can have their own thing. Um, just as with newspapers, I, I also um, have recently started writing a weekly column in the newspaper. And um, of course, the newspaper gets to a very limited audience. But again, you find that in societies where not everybody has access to newspapers, that somehow the readership goes around much more than you would think. There are newspapers, for example, that are published in indigenous languages. One person will buy it, and you'll get to places where, um, and, you know, in, in a lot of um, life, our lives, there's a lot of waiting and, and perhaps waiting to be hired for something or, or, or to sell your market or whatever. And there will be groups of people sitting around. One will have the, the newspaper. They may start off with their Bible reading and discuss that. And then they will go on to reading the newspaper in the vernacular. And the way that that newspaper will be dissected and read from page to page is so much more um, than those of us who can read and glance at the headlines and skim through. So that we should never neglect any medium. I mean, we're talking about the, you know, the electronic or these inter ICTs, you know, th these ones which are very much up to date. But the point is that there is no barrier as long as people are ready to talk to each other about what they have uh, read. I, I was saying to somebody earlier that the internet to me is a bit like a library. I mean, this building here, I'm made to understand, is full of books. It's a whole library. I've got to tell you, I could not possibly in any way read every single book here. I'm going to make choices about what, what I'm going to read. Just as a person who stocks up this library is going to make choices about what they put into it. So I, I think that whilst the technology may be intimidating or um, make me look as if we can't have access to it, we shouldn't demonize it or glorify it more than perhaps it is, um, it is. It is, at the end of the day, there are still only going to be 24 hours in a day. You're going to have other things to do and you're going to have to decide what you're going to read and what you're going to skip or what you're going to put away for later. And this happens whether it's books, whether it's newspapers, whether it's the internet. And um, if we skim, I think that's fine. If, if we're superficial, we may be caught up by those who have been less superficial and thought, you've got that wrong. Go and check your facts, or rather, I would put you right on the facts. All these things happen. Um, I, I would say much more, except to say that the last thing that I think that any woman who is involved in any kind of activism will always do their best to negate is the um, expression that women are their own worst enemies. I think that if we use that expression at all, it probably means that we hobble ourselves individually, not that another woman hobbles me by refusing to vote for me or for bitching about me behind my back or for saying, why is she doing this? But simply because we... Well, I think that actually the, um, the first speaker talked about modesty but there's a way in which perhaps our modesty becomes um, crippling. And that's why I think that the importance of speaking out 
however stupid, however disjointed you sound, at the end of the day, you have something to say. Women are actually the most supportive part of the women's, of, of women in any kind of public life. And I'm sure that even the Margaret Thatchers found this. I certainly, I mean, about two years ago, when um, Sanya Bacha was going completely nuclear and arresting everybody inside, even innocuous people like me who only argue with our mouths. Um, of course, I quickly ran into hiding because, as I said, courage is not necessarily top of my list. I, um, it was my friends, a woman housed me, um, women in my household looked after my daughter, and at every stage I have found, whether it is um, childcare, whether it is um, housecare, whatever it is, that it is women who help. And which is not to say that the men are not supportive. I've been speaking to other women, um, university women, they've said that the men are desperate to find women who will stand up and talk. But if, if you do, you'll be surprised at the amount of support you'll get. Of course you'll get the ones who will, um, who will cut you down. But there are enough who will be supportive. And perhaps lastly, the, when we hobble ourselves, we shouldn't look at the externals. I mean, people say just as they would say to you, Muslim women. And if you look at this room, and we assume that most of the women in this room are Muslim women, surprise, surprise, not all of them conform to the stereotype of Muslim women. Just as African women, they'll say, what is the situation of African women? What is the situation of Nigerian women? Surprise, surprise, there is no stereotype. We have to break out of these stereotypes, which are a useful shorthand, perhaps, that tell us nothing about each other. We're always surprised when we find people who don't fit in to our stereotypes. Whatever they're dressed like, the things that they will say will be different. And if they are not um, dressed in a particular way, for example, I feel that in my part of Nigeria, the problem for women is the fear of not getting married. The fear that if I do this or I don't do this, I will find a husband. I can say till I'm blue in the face that the population figures actually don't support this idea that you won't find husbands. There are a surplus, a surplusage of men. But the fact is that women are culturalized to think that if you behave in certain ways, you won't find husbands. In other parts of the same Nigeria, women are fighting against the idea of being married off at early ages when they don't want to be married off. Their problem is not, not finding husbands. Their problem is that husbands are found for them rather sooner than they would want. Mm -hmm. So. But they are different, but they are equally, they can be equally crippling, is the point that I want to make. So the apparent freedom, I mean, you may have heard of the book, The Beauty Myth. The apparent freedoms are not necessarily quite as liberating as they seem. And apparent restrictions are also not necessarily as restricting as they seem.